I need to confess this morning that this week I have never had so much fun studying out anything in my life. When you get into the tabernacle, how many know it's good stuff? It is good stuff. And what we have realized about the, the Torah is you find answers in it based upon the questions that you ask as you come into it. I don't know how many sermons from different angles that I've preached Genesis 1 through 3. And each time there is something new, there is something real, there is something powerful there for us to be able to learn from our lives. Now, primarily, and I have always heard the tabernacle taught about how it represents Jesus, and how many know that is true, and that is actually the ultimate truth. But I want to look at it, I'm finding out that there, I, I can see myself and the duties that I have in the body of Messiah in that tabernacle that have been laid waste, that have been uh, deserted by the body. We have never been taught all the things that we're supposed to do. How many know the real power of your walk with God is not represented here in the service today? It's after you leave. It's what you do in your day in and your day out life. It's what you do at your job. It's what you do in the streets of this city. And we, we have turned into Greek theater. It's all staged here, and then there's nothing to do out there. Actually, it's the opposite, isn't it? The greatest anointing in your life is manifested after you leave this place today. When you choose to do the word, when everything in the world is getting you not to do it. How many know the world is opposed to the commandments of God? Sometimes they build their political platforms on violations of God's word. And God says, I'm sending you out there to live it, to be a testimony. Now, I'm already getting ahead of myself, but that's okay, because we need to understand the blessing of God is coming to those who are faithful to his commandments, who are faithful to who Jesus really is, regardless of what goes on in the economy. God, there, there has to be this contrast. That's one of the things that God's doing in this day and this hour. When we saw the election this year, there was an absolute contrast in many ways of either you vote for this or you vote for that. And some of the platform was this, they, America, a good portion of America this year voted for iniquity right. because that was the platform of that political place. And we're seeing it in the churches. We're seeing churches wake up to their Hebraic heritage. I've, I've got one of our graduates down in, in Arkansas. I got to go down there and preach at, uh, at his church. In fact, they're probably going to, one of these days, we're going to have a whole busload come up from Arkansas just to join us. And he's beginning to teach them about the commandments and to teach them about the Sabbath. And they're hungry people that want God. When I, when I saw a traditional Pentecostal church, and when you walk in now behind the pulpit, they have a baptismal, and they have the Ark of the Covenant painted over the top of it. And one of the youngsters who plays trumpet in the church comes up and sounds the shofar, and everybody gets excited and applause. How many know that's a little bit different church than it maybe was a couple of years ago? God is doing some things, and they're transitioning to some things. God's going to bless that. Let me tell you something, too. God's going to bless those who take their priesthood seriously. Now, the first scripture I want to look at is Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 12. And this is talking about that God was switching from the, from the Aaronic priesthood to the Melchizedekian priesthood, which was actually plan A. If you read in the Torah, when, when Israel rejected the voice of God, God says, I would that you would have been a nation of priests, but because you've rejected my voice, uh, I'm going to have the Levitical priesthood, and then there's a subdivision within the Levitical priesthood, the Aaronic priesthood, or the Kohanim, that are going to serve me. But how many know God always tends to bring us back to plan A? The Melchizedekian priesthood is the priesthood of the firstborn. That all the way back to Adam, there was a knowledge of God that was contained. And Jesus, how many know he is the high priest over the order of Melchizedek? And it's that priesthood that we're entering into. And we have never been taught how to function in that priesthood. 
Not really. Now, I've taught an entire course on the priesthood of the believer, and in that course, I did it from the Levitical priesthood and that within our mouths should be wisdom and how that we need to be teaching others around us the Word of God. But what I want to get into now is the Cohen side of the priesthood, what we're going to find out from the Word this morning, that when that changed with Melchizedek, it changed about what the sons of Aaron would do, that we now enter into that same type of priesthood today. Do you know how to do that? Do you know how the furniture in the tabernacle represents things that I do within myself and that I do in my own life that God sees that was a type and a shadow of what was in the tabernacle? Now it says, for the priesthood being changed, that there is of necessity a change also of the law, that, that there was a changing of the Torah God went back to plan A. But what I, what I love about it, like I said, is it's not something that was dropped on them new. They knew about it. They knew that God went to plan B with the Levites and with Aaron. But I tell you what, God has, one of the things I found out about God, Brother Chuck, is God will work you around and let you go through the wilderness a hundred times until he gets you back to plan A. How many of us have wandered in the wilderness a few times until God worked us back to plan A? I have I've gotten smart enough now I'm saying, Lord, where's plan A? I would just rather go directly to it. First Peter, and I'm going to read a couple of these from the complete Jewish Bible, simply because I think because uh, Dr. Stern is, is Hebraic sensitive, he properly translated these scriptures and brought out some things that you don't necessarily get. Uh, out of the King James Version of the Bible. And as you come to him, the living stone, rejected by people but chosen by God and precious to him, you yourselves as living stones are being built into a spiritual house to be what? Koanim. Koanim, an ironic priesthood. Koanim, set apart for God to offer spiritual sacrifices. That's plural. Now, we know about offering the sacrifice of praise, and charismatics like to offer the sacrifice of praise just as long as God doesn't mess with all this stuff in my life that I'm trying to keep hid from him. When you find out that it's sacrifices, all your junk's got to be taken care of. All your stuff's got to be taken care of. All your fleshliness has got to be taken care of. All the sins that so easily beset you got to be taken care of. Your pride's got to be taken care of. And God says when you take care of it, that's a sacrifice. Now let's go on to 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. But you are a chosen people, the king's koanim, a holy nation of people for God to possess. Why? In order for you to declare the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, better change the slide, shouldn't I? <laughs> Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Before you, were not, you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And what we don't realize a lot of time in the very phraseology, you who were not a people have become a people, that deals with Ephraim. For Ephraim was a people that became not a people. And then he was scattered into, the, into all the Gentiles to, to become the fullness of the Gentiles. And through Messiah, how many know that Ephraim is waking up to who he is? He's waking up to who he is. He's shaking off his paganism. Let me tell you something. Paganism is sneaky. Do you realize that? Paganism is sneaky. It's not all our fun stuff. It's, in all, it's about in everything that we do. Now, we have, we have dealt with this before, but how many know that when, when you end a prayer in the Hebrew, it's amen, in, or amen in Greek, it's amen. Why do we say amen? Because the Catholic Church pulled an Egyptian god named Amen and invokes him every time you end your prayer. And sometimes they, they, they did it with raw, Amen Ra. It should be Amen or Amin. But you see how sneaky paganism is? And sometimes we don't even realize it. Let me tell you something. That one's a hard one to break, too. <laughs> it's just the Baptist in me, you know? <laughs> Baptist, that one you get engraved on, engraved on, you have to say that at least 15 times during a good sermon. But we need to understand sometimes how ingrained paganism can be, and searching it out sometimes is not comfortable. I've seen people throw up their hands in frustration and says, everything is pagan. I said, uh-huh. On the nose, you got it. 
We thought we were living in a Christian nation and we're living in a Christian nation filled with paganism. And finally, I want to look at Revelation 1, 6. And has formed us into into him a kingdom to be priests. Uh, The King James says kings and priests. In the Greek, it literally reads a kingdom of priests. Because God's trying to take us back to plan A. Yes, there is the fivefold ministry, and the fivefold ministry is here to prepare the priesthood. And all of us have our place. And all of us have, have that part that we're supposed to do in the kingdom. Turn to your neighbor and say, I've got a part to do. I've got a part to do. Now, that may be shocking to you. Because the way that we've done everything is the preacher does it all. No, I am here to mentor you, to coach you, to teach you how to walk with God yourself. Because I can't walk your walk for you. I can't do it. Are you ready to get into the outer court this morning? I want to look in, and looking at this, I was trying to find the, the best way to, to do this, but I think we really need to deal with the brazen uh, laver first because when the priest came in, he could not go and do anything with the brazen altar until he first visited this. Let's look in Exodus chapter 30, verses 17 through 19. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Thou shalt also make a laver of brass, and his foot also of brass, to wash withal. And thou shalt put it in between the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, and thou shalt put water therein. For Aaron and his sons shall wash their feet, and uh, their hands and their feet thereof. Guys, we need to understand a couple of things here. Number one, there were two times they went to that. They would go to that. They would wash their hands and their feet before they ministered at the altar. After they finished at the altar, they went back and would wash their hands and feet again. Number one, that shows you how, how holy that altar is. That you do not approach that altar without having some word. You know, there are two times in the New Testament that this brazen labor is referred to if you understand the Hebraic mindset. The first one is in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 6 when Paul was talking about the bride and that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Washing of water by the word. Every time you go into the word of God, you need to wash your hands, which means what I do. Wash your feet where I've been. And that word shows you some things of what you've been doing and some things of where you've been going that you need to go ahead and tie down to that altar. It's a process of sanctification. The modern church does not like this process. We like hyper grace. It all gets done at the cross, and we don't realize, guys, the centerpiece of 90% of the worship, 90% of what was done in the tabernacle was done in the outer court. And we don't do any of it anymore. What we approach the word for is I'm going to see how I can be blessed. I'm going to see how I can get a God in a full Nelson and see if I can get him to make me give me money. You can't chase after blessings. Blessings are supposed to chase after you. When you meditate on the commandments of the Lord your God and to do what he says, he causes your way to be prosperous. It's just like people that, why are people chasing after signs and wonders? If you're a believer, signs and wonders are supposed to follow you. Isn't that kind of the tail wagging the dog? Putting the cart before the horse? But when I go to this word, and God shows me something about me, come on, does not only do that with preachers? I've had a stinking attitude all week, and I open up the word, there I behold my stinketh attitude right there in the word. And God says, you better give that up. You better wash that off. Boy, the modern Christian don't like that. Don't give me no conviction. I mean, there's difference in conviction and condemnation. Condemnation, there's no hope with it. You did bad. God says, you got this. I need to convict you so that you can repent so that I can free you of it. 
And so they would go and they would, they, they would wash their hands and their feet. But you know, that's not the only place that we see the brazen altar referred to in the New Testament. Let's go to James chapter 1, verses 20 through to 25. And he has this about doing the word, keeping the commandments. You know what I found in my life? If you do the word, the word will work. If you do the word with the right heart. Some people are trying to work it into some kind of secret sauce just to get money or to get, drive a Cadillac. I have found out that God doesn't care what you drive as long as it's sanctified to him and he'll help give you what you need and it'll get there when you need it to. We, we need to quit being so caught up in external things and get caught up in the internal things. The Bible says, behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Does that mean God doesn't want us to have nice things? No, that just means God doesn't want the nice things to have us. Verse 22, and be a doer of the word, not a hearer only, deceiving your own selves. For if, a, for if you be a hearer of the word, not a doer only, you are like it unto a man beholding his face in a glass or a mirror, and he beholdeth himself and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whosoever looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. How does that tie into the brazen labor because it was the mirrors of the women of Israel that they used to make the brazen labor. They had to give up all their mirrors. And so in the, to a Hebraic mind, when you saw the labor, that's where all the mirrors went. And that thing was polished, and so when you, when you looked down into it to wash your hands, you saw yourself. When you looked down into it to wash your feet, you saw yourself. I thought that was so fascinating. You see, the way God works is first you walk up to that labor, and as you're washing, God sees you where you need to change. God allows you to see yourself where you need to change. Then you go over and you take care of it at the brazen altar, and then when you come back, God now sees you, lets you see yourself who you are now. Oh, guys. How many times have people lost their miracle? They lost that thing. God did something, but they never went back to the Word to find out who they are now. Now that you've been to the altar and that's been taken care of, who are you now? And instead you see who you were instead of who you are. And if you can't get that change, the devil will try to drag you back to who you were. See, that's part of your priesthood is a discovery of who you are in Messiah. That I'm walking out my salvation. I'm working that thing out with fear and trembling before a holy God, believing that he will cause me to will and to do his good pleasure. Guys, it's time for us to put the labor to good use. The brazen altar. Exodus 27, verses 1 and 2. And thou shalt make an altar of shittim wood or achaia wood, five cubics long and five cubics broad, and the altar shall be four square, and the height thereof shall be three cubics. And thou shalt make the horn upon it, the four corners thereof, and his horn shall be of the same, and he shall overlay it with brass. Now, why is it five by five? There are a couple of interesting things because the what you offer there, you offer up to God. Sometimes it's called the, the burnt offering, the altar of burnt offering. You're sending something up before God. And I, I think of my old military days. You know, when you're, you're serving in the military and, and, and you have to be on the radio when you're first setting everything up and, and it's coming in clear, what do you say? I'm receiving you five by five. And the brazen altar was five by five. I know that God is necessarily encoding the military <laughs> into, the, into the word of God, but I just thought that was interesting. How many times do we really need God to hear us five by five? He can't do it because we've never been to the brazen altar. But the reason it was five by five is because five is the number of grace. God gave grace in the old covenant. God gave grace in the Brit Hadashah, the new covenant. It's the same grace that was completed by the same altar because the brazen altar is a type and shadow of a cross. I don't know about you, but this is making me happy. 
There are interesting, some interesting things about uh, this brazen altar. Have you ever heard somebody say, grab a hold of the horns of the altar? A whole lot of old-timers. I went there, and I, I went down to, the, to the, the front altar in church, and I grabbed on to the horns of the altar until I got my breakthrough. That's what it's talking about. There were horns there that were used to tie down what needs to die there. But also, if you needed grace from God, if you needed sanctification from God, if you needed God to move, you would go. There were, there were certain situations that you read in the Old Testament where they needed intervention by God. The person would run and he would grab hold of the, alt, the horns of the altar and he would not let go until he got his breakthrough. There's only one guy that wouldn't repent, but he ran to the altar and grabbed on the horns and he died anyway. Out of all the ones in the Old Testament. Guys, how many times have, with, with the way that we do modern Christianity, there is never any grabbing of the horns of the altar? Never, ever. Just confess. Just confess. You better confess after you grab the horns and you get your breakthrough. Sometimes it just crying out before God, weeping out before God is a necessary part of our Christian walk. It's something not really practiced a lot anymore. We want people to lay hands on us. We want a little dabble, do you? And, and you know, it's, it's almost, some church services, it's almost like the preacher's supposed to have this super whammy that he whams you upside the head with it, knocks you over. When you wake up, everything's this peachy keen. That's not in the Word. I don't see Jesus doing that, do you? There is, there is a ministry of laying on of hands. But somehow or another, we, we've, we've mingled showmanship and some pagan practices in with, with the ministry that God shows in His Word. And sometimes just getting before God and just, and just letting it all out. And it doesn't always have to be up here at church. How many know that your own prayer closet is where you can roll around in the floor and cry and pray and scream, kick your feet, whatever else you need to do to get it out? There needs to be some more of that in our lives. I remember there's been times in my lives that uh, I've screamed and kicked and I've went on and, and just let God help me get it out. You know what I found out for me? It was very therapeutic. The pain that I felt or the anger that I felt or the frustration that I felt or the, the anguish, you know, there's a lot of things that can happen. But, but when you do that and you're just honest before God, that's why God loved David. David, this, you know, when you read the Psalms, I just love the Psalms. Somebody come against me and say, God just knocked her teeth out. I mean, no, he didn't hide anything back from God. And sometimes you got, you got to confess it, you got to let it out before you can deal with it. So many times we just get try to get so religious with it. But what's also interesting is if, let's say if I lived in that time and, and I was bringing my, my sacrifice up and the priests were doing their thing, if I ever had opportunity just to touch the brazen altar, if I could touch it, I was therefore, I was considered from that moment on sanctified. How many know that if you could ever be touched by the cross... If you could ever be touched by what Jesus did for us, there's a sanctifying that goes on with that. I did a little bit of research this week, and I ran across this, this really great book. It's called The Holy Vessels and Furniture of the Tabernacle. And there's a couple of quotes that I want to give and him trying to bring out some things. And it says, the Hebrew word for altar, and it's mizbeach, in the Hebrew, has a distinct reference to the thought of sacrifice being derived from the verb uh, signifying display or, or slaughter. Our word altar is from Latin signifying high. Now, I need to stop right there. That's where the Catholic Church gets their understanding of altar because that's where the pagans put all their altars. We were supposed to go up to the high places and knock over the altars. And then because when, when paganism came in, they, made, they, they just simply tried to put the name of Jesus on it and say it was okay. So, when, and so what we derive from that when we think of altar is supposed to be a high place. No. Our job, guys, is to kick over the high places. To kick them over. We need to go back to the Hebrew. When I talk about going to the altar, there has to be a slaying. There has to be something die. There has to be a crucifixion. 
when I go to that altar. He goes on to say, so that in the English language, the true meaning of the original is not expressed. How many would agree with that? When you really understand. He goes on to say, whether an individual Israelite or of the assembled congregation approached to worship God, this holy vessel was called into requisition, and the very consecration of the priesthood itself advanced only step by step with the sanctification of this altar. And so what we're going to find out in our service to God, it's the brazen altar that is going to help us be sanctified as priests to the Most High God. Why is that? I mean, no, God wants to do stuff in your life. But I found out with kids, you know, if they have a hold of something and you want to give them something, they can't take a hold of anything new until they let go of what they have. And I found out in our own lives, we, we, there, there's, there's spiritual room. There's, when, when we see them, when they went into Israel and they were supposed to get rid of all the ites, when you read the, the root name of every one of those, it, it can mean things like unforgiveness or bickering or, or procrastination. And so we, when we get saved, we have spiritual territory right here, and we need to get rid of all the ites so that the kingdom can move in. And I can't receive of God from God something if I don't give up the counter to it. You can't receive forgiveness until you let go of the sin. There's principles of binding and loosing, and there's, there's spiritual principles that, there, that th th there are no voids. How many know in nature, nature abhors a void that wants to always fill it with something? You either have the kingdom of darkness or the kingdom of God. You either have something that needs to be burnt on the altar, because until it's burnt on the altar, you don't make room for what God wants to give you. And so as I, as I allow those things to be burnt up in the presence of God, I can begin to be sanctified in those areas. And still to this day, I mean, uh, God, we, we, guys, we got a lot of stinking thinking we need to get rid of. How many churches have we seen problems, not because they weren't maybe doctrinally correct, but they weren't correct here? Attitudes. False understandings of things. Sometimes I'm, I'm always amazed at how sometimes people get stuff in their head. And it, and it wasn't from a dictionary. It wasn't from an encyclopedia. It was from something that happened in their life that the devil embedded a lie. Have we ever seen that in, in our, even in our own lives? You know, everybody treats me bad when I was a kid, therefore I, I, I must not be loved. I, mu I must be bad. Or this, that, or the other. Or we equate, well, I, you know, for a lot of girls, well, I was pretty, therefore all my self-esteem is wrapped up in pretty. How many know that as you get older, sometimes pretty kind of changes its definition just a little bit? I found out gravity kicks in. <laughs> things things start, start sagging. It didn't used to sag. Uh, have, have I said enough there? <laughs> I woke up one day, Brother Chuck, and I found out the pants I used to wear now are just big enough to go around my thigh. <laughs> Things change, definitions change, but we see an entire generation killing themselves because they have been convinced the, that youth equals beauty when the Bible says there's a beauty in holiness. There's a beauty in holiness. The true beauty is there. You can't get it from CoverGirl or Maybelline. Or any of the other ones. I mean, you can try even the newer stuff they got that, you know, is this, well, it's just all natural minerals. Yeah, but it's, it, it's not true beauty. True beauty comes from here. True beauty comes from the inside. Let's look here at another one. Let's see. I, I'm sorry, guys. I didn't change the slide on you. No wonder you guys are looking at me like, I wish you changed the slide. Now I know why. Another name by which this vessel is distinguished is the altar of burnt offering. Our word burnt offering hardly expresses the meaning of the original, Ola, which signifies ascending. Now here's what we've not realized. That was a worship to God when they, when they would take those burnt offerings and they would stretch them out and lay them out and offering them up to God. Now because of the cross... I can take my sin, my sinful nature, 
and I can place it on that altar and let the fire of the Holy Spirit burn that up, and it's a sweet-smelling savor in the nostrils of God. As long as it's on you, it stinks like fish on ice. But the minute that you take that and you say, I love you more than this, and I sacrifice it, and I ask that the fire of the Holy Spirit will consume that thing up in my life, that thing ascends to God as worship. And one of the big things that we've got going on in most of the, uh, most of the church universal today is we praise him from our lips, but our hearts are far from him because we never place anything on the brazen altar. We look at that thing and we say, you got to love me as I am. You got to love me as I am. How many have had kids say that? You know, you got to love me because I'm the baby. <laughs> He accepts you where you are, but he loves you enough never to let you stay there. <coughs> oh, guys. He goes on to say, an odor of sweet savor. The word conveys the thought of the blessed acceptance in which all went up unto the Lord from the fire of the altar. Not only so, but that all that was placed thereon was for the Lord and for him alone. Our own sinful ways are for the Lord alone. I've got to give them to him. Jesus bore them on the cross. That, that is a spiritual reality. But what it makes a reality in my life is when I take that thing and I nail it to the cross. It's not me anymore. I become dead to it. The moment you become dead to it, then he can truly receive it. You know, even with, with healing, how many know that by his stripes we are healed? And sometimes we can't always understand why sometimes healing doesn't come the way that it should. But, you know, I've seen folks that aren't healed because it gives them the excuse to act the way they are. They say, I want, I want prayer for healing but they really don't because the, 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 they can act this naughty way that they're acting and, and everything else because they're sick and me, you got to tolerate me because I'm sick. Now, that's sometimes rare occasion, but how many know we see that in some other areas? I can't give up my pain of the past because it allows me to be the little poop head that I am right now. And I have an excuse for being that way because the many, oh, if you ever knew what happened to me when I was a kid, and blah, 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 blah. Crucify it. Get on the other side of it. You know why? As long as we stay in victim mode, the devil triumphs. But when I've been crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I. It's Christ living in me. That's when, when I lay that thing on the altar and let it be consumed. Then Messiah can begin ruling and reigning in me. I used to be hurt. I used to be ornery. I used to, I used to look for everybody just to find it because I had an attitude. But you know what? I got healed. I found out Jesus took my pain. And now I can become an ambassador of grace and love in the earth. Because that, that, that's how you move for, to having a testimony. But we, we don't thank things on the altar the way that we should. I've got one last one from this book. If you can get it, get this book. It's an awesome little book. I actually have it with some of my software that came for free, and I discovered it. I almost kind of had church when I, when I found it. Listen to this. The blood of the Paschal lamb was means of averting wrath. Whilst the burnt offering on the altar testified of cleanness and perfect acceptance on the part of the offerer. Oh, get that. Once the blood's been shed, you're accepted. Now take that thing, and as God consumes it, he says, the reason I'm consuming this out of your life, you brought it to me, and I accept you. Oh, I, I read this, and it just made me happy. The farmer represents the death of Christ uh, as the only way of escape from judgment. The latter, again, presents to us the same death, but as the means whereby we are made acceptable worshipers before God and have access into his presence, being estimated according to all the value of the lamb slain. 
That's deep. That's why I can bear his name. Oh. Guys, it's time for us to put the brazen altar back to work in our lives. That is a majority of our priesthood. And guys, Mike, it's not for me to go get your stuff and put it on the altar. Dad, it's not for me to get your stuff and put it on the altar. I got to put my own stuff. That's, that's a big part of my priesthood is dealing with my stuff because as I deal with my stuff, then Christ can shine through in me. And I realize layer upon layer, line upon line, precept upon precept, what he's done for me and how much he loved me and how that I am now accepted in the beloved. Hopefully this is allowing you to connect some different scriptures into, in, in your own mind and to bring some, some of it together. Now, when we look at symbolism in the Bible, bronze always signifies judgment. Even the bronze serpent that was lifted up represented Christ, as well as the judgment for what they had done. Gold represents purity and holiness and goodness, silver redemption and wood, humanity and flesh. So the brazen altar was made out of Achaia wood, out of flesh that was wrapped in judgment. How many know on the cross, he bore all all of our judgment. All the wrath, all the punishment was placed upon him. We see that at the brazen altar. But we also need to understand some things. I in my life have to learn how to walk in grace and judgment. This is another one Christians don't like. They don't like the word judgment. They freak out. God's getting ready to judge some things. I thought you were in Christ. I am. <laughs> no, you're not. At least not up here. But when we go to God's commandments, guys, now what they always like to quote is, judge not thou lest thou shall be judged. That's judging people. And a lot of times it's, it's almost uh, judging them derogatory because of the color of their skin or because of whatever else, you know. Uh, kind of like when the... Uh, the Pharisee was praying and he said, Lord, I thank you that I'm not like this publican. Judging people because of things. We don't judge people, but we judge circumstances all the time. When you understand the commandments, the commandments are there so that I can judge clean from unclean. Holy from the profane. Righteousness from iniquity. And that brazen altar helps. When, when I find something and I see something that I need to judge, I need to drag that thing and tie it down to the altar and let the fire of God consume it. Don't let it off. Now, the, what I have found is what, what we'll do there. There are a reason there were horns on that altar. Tie that bad boy down and say, come on, God, light this fire. Consume this thing and don't let it off until it's reduced to ash. Sometimes people don't pray through and stay there at the brazen altar until the bondage or whatever they're dealing with is completely broken by God. Sometimes you've got to let that thing take a while. You want, you want to talk about, you know, you think our services are long? You know, our, our, our praise and worship. Some people say, well, I just thought it was just supposed to be two or three songs. Well, that's, that's the old style of, you know, you have a couple of duets and a sermonette, and you go out and smoke a cigarette type of thing. We're not into that here. We want you to get into the presence of God. But guys, on, on, on holy days, they would take this huge ox or this huge bull, this huge calf, and they would kill it, and they would put it on there, and they would worship until it was reduced to ash. That's just a little while. Have you ever barbecued? Can you imagine taking all that meat you're throwing on there and staying there and worshiping until it falls through the grace's ash? Say, yeah, that's what's happening to my dinner right now because you're preaching so long. Well, then you're still being biblical. <laughs> we need to learn to do that. And what, what is really cool on the, on the outer court, you see judgment everywhere. Now, when you get into the holy place and the holy of holies, you know there's brass in there too? But it's covered where you can't see it. It's covered by gold or silver. It's still there. 
it just shows us that God covered it. As we get into the other places, it's going, we're going we're to find out the e- even the Ark of the Covenant, guys, was wood covered in gold. Now, we understand Messiah, that he was Almighty God come in human flesh. And we, we have this conundrum. This is part of what this outer court is about. Watchman Nee in his book, The Ministry of the Word, makes a profound statement. He says, we have the Word, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. He said, now I, as a believer, got the flesh, and I've got to work with God until that flesh becomes the Word. That's what this whole process is about, process of sanctification. In fact, if you understand it really, then Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 finally make sense. Because Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2 is all about the brazen altar and the brazen labor. It's all about it. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present yourselves a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable what? Service. All right, priests, this is your reasonable service, to take your life and to place it up there on that altar, to be consumed in the fire of God. This is your reasonable service. But he doesn't stop there. Then he looks back at the, at, the, at the labor, and he says, Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. When I go back to that word and find out who I am now, it transforms me. It's the the Greek word that we get the word metamorphosis from. How many know what you were is not who you are, and you're you're not quite where you should be, but how many know God has a plan for you because every one of us are predestined to be conformed into the image of Jesus? That's the end goal. The more that is sacrificed, and let me tell you something, there were morning and evening burnt offerings every day to God. And God was trying to say, listen, you got a lot that you need to burn up. And as the Holy Spirit works in my life, you know, he starts with some of the big things, the obvious things. But I have found out, guys, the more that I walk with God, the narrower the road gets. I can't get away with what I used to get away with. Because I've come too far. That where I am now in Christ is so much more precious than me being able to have some of the flesh outs I used to have. It's too expensive for me. I refuse to do it. I refuse to try to go get that ash and make it back into something again. I refuse to do it. When we look at this altar, it's all about the crucified life. But I've got one last scripture And it may kind of seem out of place. In fact, I almost forgot it and got up here and God reminded me of it. This is talking about the return of the Lord. In fact, this same expression is quoted by Paul here in 1 Thessalonians, and then Peter quotes it. I believe it's in 1 Peter. He quotes the same phrase. And unless you're Jewish or you understand your Hebraic heritage, you just say, when the Lord comes back, he's going to be snaky. When you least expect it, the Lord is sneaky. I've heard guys preach that. I, I actually sat one time, and it was in a Baptist church way back in the woods somewhere, and the whole title of his sermon was, The Lord is Sneaky. <laughs> He's going to wait till you're in that movie theater watching something you're not supposed to watch, and when you're going to get the rapture, and you got some explaining to do. <laughs> Anybody ever hear sermons like that? Oh, but of the times and seasons, brother, ye have no need that I write this unto you. So this was common knowledge. This expression was common knowledge. For you know, uh, you know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. That is a Hebraic colloquialism. That the high priest, you see that this brazen altar... You had to keep the fire burning. The fire was given by God, but it's our responsibility to keep it burning. That that thing burnt 24 hours a day. But see, if you were one of the unlucky guys, how I many know it's real easy keeping it burning at noon? It's in the midnight hour. It's in the midnight hour that it's hard. And so if you were a newbie priest up there on the Temple Mount, 
And you had this idea, I'm going to stoke that bad boy up. And I mean, you got wood stuck out of every corner and it just got it piled up and you got this blazing, raging thing. It gets kind of cold at night and you get, well, this is kind of, this is good. Yeah, I got enough wood there. I can just kind of ignore the altar. Does it sound like the church today? Ignore the altar. And he kind of curl up and just kind of go to sleep. And the fire went down and down and down, and all there was left was hot coals. And the high priest would come up as a thief in the night to inspect the newbies up on the Temple Mount. And there was Bubba. He was all just up on the Temple Mount. And so the priest would take the pan, the ash pan, he would take and take some of those coals up, and he would kind of place it on the guy's outer garment, down by his feet. And uh, he'd get nice. I mean, it's just like an electric blanket. And he would wake up as his clothes would. Because you see, scriptures, let, let, let us not be like that, because he would, he, would, he would have to cast off his garments, and he became a streaker. All he, all he had left was his BVDs, and he was running off the Temple Mount for everybody to expose that he had stopped ministering at the brazen altar. Now, Jesus said, and Paul said, and Peter said, that's the way it's probably going to be when he comes back. Does it sound like the church today? That we have abandoned the brazen altar. It's all grace, it's all good. Just have the best life now. Well, you can't have the best life until the old life is burnt up. Right. And now you have the life of Christ. We just want to be accepted. You can't be accepted until you deal with the cross and you deal with that altar and burn up the old things. And when God receives it, he says, you finally released it to the cross. And see, it's my job. I taught an entire series on, on strange fire, holy fire. It's my job. I can't create the fire. I've got to seek God and let the Holy Spirit come to give the fire. But guys, it's my responsibility to keep that fire stoked. That's part of my priesthood. I can't... I, I, it's my, <laughs> God's requiring us to stay hot in the Holy Spirit, to keep that fire stoked in our lives. There, when, when Paul was re, write, writing to Timothy, he said, there's things that you can do to stir up the gifts that are within you. Yeah. I mean, I hear lately, yesterday, I was down in my office at home, and I just, I, I, I went ahead and, usually when I play an album, I just play the whole album. I thought I was going to be, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be like a teenager. I'm going to start cutting my own, my own tracks, you know, and making my own, my own mix. And so I mixed some songs together. Three times yesterday, I hit the ground down in my office. <laughs> because music that's anointed, that doesn't have the proverbial electric guitar cat fights in it, okay? I, the presence of God comes in and God ministers to me. And it's like the presence of God would come in so strong, man, I, I, I just cry like a baby. I come upstairs, get water, and go, <laughs> Mary says, what's wrong? Music. <laughs> Because each one of us have different things. I've got some sermons that are over 30 years old I've got on tape. I don't lend them out. I need to go ahead and bring them up here and convert them to MP3 just to secure them. But when I'm feeling so down that you've got to look up to look at the belly of a roach, I've got certain sermons that I'll pull out that I will listen to that will minister to me, and it stirs up that fire. And each one of us, it's different things for us. Just like in the flesh, I mean, the fires of hell, there are certain things if you let stir, will get you into trouble. In God, there are certain things you can stir that bring you closer to God. It's my responsibility, my responsibility, because what stirs and builds the fire in me may be different than what stirs and builds the fire in you. And part of our priesthood is when the Lord comes back, he finds my fire stoked on the altar for him. How many believers do we know that have, their lives have grown cold because they've never attended to their altars? Never really attended to them the way they're supposed to. In fact, I know a lot of believers that have never, ever 
put wood and ask God to light the fire because they never taught that was part of their reasonable service unto God. And in the days ahead, guys, God's loosening it. There's, there's an anointing of favor right now, but there's also an anointing that God is saying, if you begin tending to your priesthood, I'll transform everything. He'll transform everything. Every one of us has some flesh that needs to sizzle <laughs> and be given up on the altar because God wants to release something new of the Spirit within us. Until I learn my job and for me to take it seriously. You see, everything that we're doing now with biblical life, there was a transformation, a shift in the Spirit about September. God said, just start ministering to the remnant. That's all I care about is the remnant. The remnant. I am tired of trying to convince somebody they got to obey the word when they call themselves a believer. I am not doing that anymore. I want to prepare those that walk with him who take this word seriously. That's all I want. I have wasted 15 years, more than that, isn't it? Trying to convince people of the Sabbath, trying to convince people of this, trying to convince them that, the, that we need to obey the word and not our traditions. Never question where our traditions come from. But what I have found, I've got a son-in-law right there that didn't know the Sabbath from anything. You know how I got him obeying the Sabbath? He came to the, uh, the house date my daughter and came to Ev Shabbat meal and experienced the Sabbath of God and said, I want what your family has. You see, if I get it right here and they experience, taste and see that the Lord is good. Once, you, once you've tasted the shalom of God, you're hooked. You're hooked. There's nothing like the peace of God. And so this morning, I think the question God would have before us is have we been tending that altar? Have we been tending that altar? We need to start making lists of things that need to get sacrificed. You don't bring them in. You don't show them to anybody. <laughs> Ain't nobody's business. Because maybe the neighbor that you show it to, the, what they need to put on the altar is gossip. And the last thing you need to do is feed their wrong fire. Okay? It's between you and God. But we need to take this seriously day in and day out because the Holy Spirit is releasing an anointing for us to find what needs to be placed upon the altar. Oh. It's a serious time, yes, but I tell you what, it's a joyous time. Getting free is good stuff. Getting some joy in your life where you used to have sorrow is some good stuff. Oh. Being biblical is good stuff. I've gotten, you know, it used to be I got, I got tired of trying to explain away the word. That, that used to be some of my old days. Well, how come we don't do this? Well, you know, old brother. And I give those old sad pat answers. Now when somebody... Because the heathen, they use that. They say, well, you know, you don't keep the Sabbath. You don't do this. You don't do that. Then what makes homosexuality wrong? When they look at me and say, you don't keep the Sabbath, I say, yes, I do. Well, you still eat pork? No, I don't. Uh -uh. <laughs> it kind of throws them up. I've read those arguments on the online chats. Our educated people, I'm going I'm to end with this. I really am, I promise. Say, there's a miracle coming. He's going to get right in. I was up in Connecticut, and I was preaching at a very large, and it was kind of a Baptist church. And so it, it's, it, it was in the main sanctuary that it will seat about 9,000, but it was one of the big classrooms they had, and it was all their ministers. And I was teaching on the Sabbath and the feast versus Christmas and Easter. And you could divide the room into three sections. This one's saying, this is it. No wonder we never liked that stuff. And we've been looking for what God says to do. Then he had that middle section. Well, I don't care. I'll just do what I want to because I don't God. It don't matter to God. Then he had this section over here. You ain't going to take my Christmas. I, I was worried about this section because if there were tar and feathers in the church, they would have been used that morning. And you can see this, and the longer I preached, this side got happy, this side got boiled. I had hot, cold, and lukewarm, you know, going on right there. And there was a guy in the back. 
Because later on that afternoon, I was going to preach on educational concepts, and he was a friend of the host that, was, that actually held the chair of history at Central Connecticut University. And this guy in the back started laughing at him, at the ones that got mad. He started laughing at them. So much, so I mean belly laughing. I mean just, he thought it was the most hilarious thing. So much so that these guys shut up. You see, this guy was a professor at Harvard. And he looked at this bunch and said, you guys are morons. I'm thinking, well, I'm glad you said that, not me. (laughs) He said, I'm an educated man. Everybody kind of goes up there in New England. It's like, oh, no, I'm a professor at Harvard. They went, He says, everything this guy is saying is true. And I know that not because I'm a Christian, but because I am educated. And I've always wondered why Christians do all these pagan things and try to call it God, and now I have finally seen Jesus. I got word a couple of weeks later that uh, that man got saved. He, fi- he knew he couldn't rationalize in his educated mind why you did all this pagan stuff because that makes Jesus another Mithra, another Apollo. When he actually found out the feasts were about the Lord and, he was, and in his mind he separated the p- p- profane from the holy, he got it. You see, in our lives, I'm not arguing anymore. I'm just going to live it. And when they can see in my life there has been a separation of the holy from the profane, they're going to get it. Because I got some ash to show. (laughs) How big's your pile of ash? (laughs) Got a magnifying glass, brother? (laughs) Let me show you the ash of what God has burnt up. Holy sacrifice. You see that ash? That is a testimony in the earth that I've been accepted. God's working on me. Do you know how you can tell you're really a believer? Because I've met a lot of believers that didn't believe. I've met a lot of people that said they follow Christ that didn't. Do you know how you can believe? God says he corrects his children. If God never corrects him, you ain't his. If God never shows you anything but needs to get up on that altar, you're not his. The devil don't want you to burn that stuff up. God does. If God is gently correcting you, showing you what needs to be crucified, and then handing you the opposite. This was unrighteous. This is righteous. This was unholy. Burn it up so I can loose the holy in you. Just call it signed, sealed, and delivered. You're his. I worry about the guy whose who's, who's main thing is once saved, always saved. Once saved, always saved. I'm saying if you're saved, you live like it. You act like it. Right. What walks like a duck, talks like a duck, waddles like a duck is a duck. And if you act like a sinner, smell like a sinner, and do all the things the sinners do, you're a sinner. If you start acting like Jesus and because you love him and you start seeing God working in your life, yeah. you're moving toward becoming the remnant. That's right. That's right. Well, Father, I thank you for your word this morning. I thank you that it will not return to you void, but, Father, it will accomplish in our hearts, in our families, in our lives that which you have uh, said that it was going to. And Father, I release an anointing, Father, not only in this place, but Father, anyone who listens to the audio or watches the video, Father, that they're going to hunger and thirst after righteousness. And Father, they're going to get busy with the priesthood that God has given them. And they're going to see the works of the enemy burned up in their lives by the power of your spirit so that they can become alive in those areas through Christ. Father, we thank you and we praise you for it in Jesus' name.